Hello to all ICMI 2020 attendees, wherever you are in this world. It's my honor and privilege to talk to you about modern rape laws and how they've become not only a weapon of choice for many women, but the decisive wonder weapon that empowers and allows any woman to leverage the state to punish any man, no matter their relative positions. First, a disclaimer. Don't take what I say as gospel. I'm not a lawyer and I don't profess to comprehend the law. Despite my three master's degrees, I find this a minefield to negotiate and I can't be sure what I interpret is what the law means or practices. In any case, the gist of what I'm saying is enough to make the point. So how is rape defined in US law? For the sake of comparison, I give two definitions, pre and post 2013. Pre 13, it's the carnal knowledge of a female forcibly and against her will. This definition from 1927 was outdated and narrow. It only included forcible penetration of a female vagina with a penis. As of 1 January 13, rape is now defined as the penetration, no matter how slight, of the vagina or anus with any body part or object or oral penetration by a sex organ of another person without the consent of the victim. In the UK, the simple definition of rape is when a person intentionally penetrates the vagina, anus, or mouth with his penis without consent, and he does not reasonably believe the person consents. So basically, force is no longer required to rape. It simply requires penetration, and it crucially centers on the issue of consent or the lack of consent of the person who's penetrated. You still need a penis to rape in the UK, but the victim can be either sex. In the US, you can use an object to penetrate, but women still can't rape men. It's called made to penetrate and is classified as sexual violence. In the UK, being made to penetrate could fall under sexual assault or causing a person to engage in sexual activity without consent. In short, it's not rape if a woman coerces a man into sex. And an erection is seen as a form of consent. It's akin to saying if the woman got wet or had an orgasm during the rape, it was sex and not rape. No doubt these modern laws can and do protect vulnerable people. And for the first time, they include and protect men from other men. On the surface, like many new laws being pushed by women's groups, the changes look appropriate non-gendered in the US and somewhat fair, but in reality and practice, they punish men with the full force of the state when often no crime has been committed while excusing women raping men. Sadly, they've also given women an extremely powerful weapon that's very tempting to use in far too many situations. In effect, the state has put men on 24 hour guard or never ending anxiety taken away male liberties, increased high risk of incarceration, and denied due process. <clears throat> At the same time, these laws have infantilized women by removing their agency and accountability while allowing them to leverage their sexual powers without checks and balances. The state has said it's okay for women to flirt, expose flesh, and use sexiness to get attention, open doors, and offer opportunity or even to sleep their way to promotion, privilege, and the top. No, not all women do these things, but far too many do, and most importantly, all of them can. And as we've come to see, when it's convenient to use for some advantage, many do. But these new laws on rape don't operate in a vacuum or come from nowhere, nor do they act independently of each other. They built on each other over time and from other closely related laws, and are more evolutionary than revolutionary. It's the dismal tide of creep, but creep with a mega coordinated push from radical feminists and gullible women who don't understand the true impact and consequences of what they ask for or prove in silence. Not surprisingly, these laws have knock on effects on less direct issues and matters that further spin new laws that continue to silence and control men at best and punish and, car and incarcerate at worst. Think back to workplace laws on sexual harassment and assault spawning from the 60s and 70s and consider the ever-expanding arsenal of policies and laws 
women are currently attempting to holster with the new laws of hate and thought crimes, and now even misogyny. Note how there's no such consideration for a law on misandry, despite its ubiquitous existence on nearly every medium, and opposingly, the near dearth of discussion on the true existence, or really the non-existence, of misogyny that's remarkably seen everywhere by many women. Yes, feminists in the media conflate and twist meaning, intention, and words on a near regular basis in order to claim misogyny. Simply criticizing feminism is misogyny, as is a cat whistle or a statement of fact that hurts. This is why it's okay for Prof Professor Susanna Walters to ask and the Washington Post to publish her article, Why Can't We Hate Men? And for Mona El Tahawi to ask on Australia's ABC TV show, Q&A, how many rapists must we kill until men stop raping us? Along with the longstanding and recent rhetoric to castrate 90% of all men and to kill all men. On the other hand, dare a man joke about women. He'll be fired or forced to resign as Nobel laureate Sir Tim Hunt was forced to do after his joke during a speech at a conference in South Korea when he said, let me tell you about my trouble with girls. Three things happen when they're in the lab. In the lab. You fall in love with them, they fall in love with you, and when you criticize them, they cry. No kernel of truth allows a joke when it comes to women, especially because it's always the element of truth in a joke that makes it funny. I served my country in the US Air Force during the 80s and 90s and watched as a never ending tsunami of pressure to create safe spaces for women took over the military. It was no longer acceptable to have swimsuit calendars of women hanging on a wall or on a desk. And not long after the more obvious physical changes and restrictions were rolled out, they came for our language, banter, jokes, and male camaraderie. The minority of women had to feel, feel safe and protected, and it didn't matter how it made the supermajority men in the forces feel, nor what it did to morale or mission effectiveness. Men were counseled in their droves, and women reported allegations of harassment with ever-growing sensitivities and forms. Soon, annual training on sexual harassment was the norm. Restricted actions and words grew in composition, and what constituted harassment increased each year. Like Sir Tim Hunt, we were silenced. <clears throat> but what happened in the military and public sector was not exclusive. It was creep. Society and especially universities with its indoctrination and brainwashing of students, especially female, with its push for social, social justice, diversity, inclusion, and safe spaces, free from any kind of oppression, except on men and masculinity, of course, seems to be the culprit. We've all heard about the patriarchy, oppression, and the rape culture that exists on campus. With more women working, it was only a matter of time before these concepts found their way into all work settings. Money talks when litigation threatens. Hence, human resources departments and private companies jumped on the bandwagon and sexual harassment training, offense, and punishment were commonplace. Excuse me. Welcome to Sexual Harassment, Assault, and the Me Too movement. Sexual assault and harassment were, weren't just a man groping and grabbing a woman's tits or ass, and rape wasn't actually rape in the actual sense. It's now possible to sexually assault or rape a woman with the male gaze or words alone, by threats or perceived threats. And we're currently seeing this push on Australian college campuses at the moment where men staring at women is equated with sexual assault and counted within rape statistics. Saying hello in a creepy way, again perceived, or attempting to get to know a woman you're attracted to, unwanted, is also seen as harassment, yet remarkably and hypocritically, it's okay for a beautiful woman with a sexy body to proudly put it on display and use it to exploit men. She can use it to, to obtain favors, open doors, and even sleep with the boss to get promoted. But it's shameful, disgusting, and illegal to ask a woman at work out on a date. If it's unwanted 
attention, it's sexual harassment, and you're a pervert and a pest. In practice, all female behavior is approved as long as she's okay with it. Along these lines, Me Too was nothing more than an infamous example where many women exploited men's weaknesses and proclivities with their sexuality, trading sexual favors for potential access and work. Sexual power was used against positional power, a fair exchange, many would say, but not in our gynocentric, infantilized society that believes women don't have agency or the capacity for devious doings. Women can't decide to walk away or report foul play, and they certainly couldn't be everyday prostitutes. Feminism, women, and the media were eager to vilify one man who used his position to get sex, but let's not forget who also allowed numerous, very willing, and exploited women to use him to get much sought after work and the opportunity to become famous. So who's the perpetrator here? The man's an evil predator and must be locked up. Such is the power of perspective, culture, and definitions. Women consensually trading sex for success are rape, rape victims today. Similar to Me Too are the new forms of domestic violence or DV. Once again, like with rape laws, the laws on DV have been brought into the point that everyday life in a relationship has been criminalized for the man and rape is but one form of violence a man can easily commit in the home. It's now possible for men in the West to abuse women with words and emotions or by withholding some of his earned money or attempting to have a budget or saving for retirement. Now, I know in the US, President Trump finally changed the meaning back to the original about force, so it's not there, but nonetheless, it is in the West and in many other places. But more on point to my talk today is the fact that many women are claiming sexual abuse and rape in the relationship to gain advantage in divorce and family court. This advantage could take the form of control of the home, custody of the kids, financial gain, or to eliminate the man from her life, or to put him in jail, or all of the above. False allegations of rape are far more common than feminists care to admit or consider, and many lawyers and others in related fields know this to be true and a major problem. It's well documented that reports of a child allegedly being sexually abused by the husband or father increased from 7% to 30% over a relatively short period of time in the 1980s. Did dads all of a sudden become evil humans who raped their own kids? Of course not. Yet, sexual allegations in divorce were estimated at 20 to 80% of claims. And in 1991, two psychologists noted 500 cases of sexual allegations over a six year period, and 40% of these cases were in divorce and custody cases. And of these, there was no legal finding of abuse 75% of the time. Family law lawyers know all too well what's going nuclear. Well, they know what, excuse me. Family law lawyers know all too well what going nuclear or using the silver bullet means today. Simply accuse the husband of sexual abuse or raping her and protracted court cases of years and fighting are replaced with immediate custody of the kids, money and minimal fighting. The state becomes the woman's savior and third party executor or executor of punishment on the man. Laws on rape and DV have made alleged rape and abuse in marriage and the home, a useful plan of escape for women. A great way to get kids and money and a very efficient way to get revenge and dispose of men. Excuse me. Uh, <clears throat> so how did we get here? Feminists have long claimed sex is rape. Andrea Dorkin and Catherine McKinnon, to name two, have openly said that the mere act of sex is rape and that no woman can properly consent to it. Thanks to universities, this way of thinking has brought more and more acts into the realm of rape over the years. Just think for a moment, rape may not yet be defined as man having loving sex with a woman, but it's not far off in reality. A man and woman can go out, drink three glasses of wine each, have sex an hour later, and the law says she can't 
consent and he raped her. Maybe she's the routine drinker and he's not, and she feels fine and he feels drunk. No matter, it's rape. She gets to be mentally and or physically incapacitated, but not the man. Next, we have what I call regret rape, where the woman clearly consents to the sex on the night or time in question, but the law allows her to change her mind and see it differently the next day, week, or month after talking about it more deeply, maybe even with her feminist friends, or after getting found out. If she regrets sleeping with the man or needs an excuse, it's nothing to do with her agency. The guy clearly took advantage of her and the state creates rape where no rape took place. Closely related is rape by seduction, which relates to persuasion or being swept away. Gone are the days when a, where a woman could put up a front and say no verbally, but yes physically, so she could look pure and dignified as if it just happened, when all the while she wanted it and expected to be seduced. As Camille Paglia says, Pursuit and seduction are the essence of sexuality. It's part of the sizzle, unquote. Next, we have rape by coercion. And we're not talking about holding a gun to her head. We're talking about, about a man trying to consummate the night in a way that could make her feel she has to repay the expensive dinner he paid for. Or it could be the guy who's invested heavily over the months, who comes on a bit more assertively, and she feels pressured to pay him back. If she feels a sense of duty or debt to what she took part in and agreed to along the way, it's got nothing to do with her. He's a rapist because she felt pressure to submit. And finally, we have rape by deceit, which means a man isn't, isn't totally honest or presents himself for what he's not. For example, the man who hires a Ferrari for the weekend, who hangs out in an expensive bar, who then picks up a striving woman who presumes the man's rich and successful. So she sleeps with him all weekend in this nice hotel that he splashed out on. A pickup artist is now a rapist by law and default. Or more commonly, the man who tells little white lies or goes a bit further and says he's an airline pilot when he's simply a shop assistant. In either case, the woman thought she had a rich, successful man, a good catch, but he wasn't what he presented and she feels deceived. So she claims rape because she never would have consented to having sex with the real guy. Never mind that she wears heavy makeup, false eyelashes, had a nose job, wears four inch heels, has butt and breast implants and wears designer clothes she can't afford. He's the liar and deceiver and he must be punished severely. It's the same formula that's allowed feminism to create the rape culture myth for decades at universities, and more recently in society. They've thrown about made up numbers for many years over many forums, saying one in five and even one in four women are the victims of, a of an attempted or completed sexual assault at college. Straight away, any sane person thinking would question what they mean by sexual assault and attempted when referring to rape. Looking deeper, it turns out the much broader, broader term sexual assault is used to include rape and any one unwanted sexual contact, such as fondling or kissing, and that alcohol was a major common factor in nearly all these assaults, including the 40% of alleged rapes. Clearly, alcohol is the bigger problem. Still, the USA's Department of Justice collects and reports statistics on rape and reports that college age women from 1995 to 2013 who aren't students were sexually assaulted at a rate of 7.6 per thousand versus um, college students who were sexually assaulted at a rate of 6.1 per thousand. That's far less than 1% of women getting raped and college assaults were less than non-college assaults. Christina Hoff Summers writes that we're in the throes Quote, we're in the throes of one of those panics where paranoia, censorship, and false accusations flourish, and otherwise sensible people abandon their critical facilities, unquote. She says that feminists and, and parrot students have simply but constantly repeated the one in five women on campus is a victim of rape to incite the needed hysteria so that 
so much so that even President Obama embraced it with his April 4th, 2011 letter to universities. Yes, President Obama warned all universities that receive federal funding to take an aggressive role in the investigation and punishment of alleged sex crimes, sex crimes on college campuses and effectively assume the guilt of the accused independent of what the police or courts decided or risk losing federal funding. Title IX was its basis and the two created the infamous kangaroo courts most people have heard of or about when referring to university tribunals of accused men on campus. Rightly named because they mean no lawyer is allowed for the accused, that he can't know his accuser, he can't question his accuser, and he can't even know what's alleged. As usual, rape, rape culture exists by exaggeration from asking biased respondents, by asking leading questions, and by defining rape and assault in certain and very broad ways and circumstances. And if she was drinking, it was non-consensual -consens rape, full stop. <clears throat> and who better to create biased respondents, leading questions within surveys and omnipresent air-drenched hysteria than university departments that teach women and gender studies, or women's and gender studies, courses and degrees. The patriarchy, oppressed women, and marriage and motherhood were the tools men used to abuse and exploit women and not the other way around. Apparently, society never pressured or expected men to marry for the good of the family name, the community, or the woman. Men never felt a sense of duty and married the woman if she got pregnant. And bachelors were never shamed into doing the right thing by giving up a life of debauchery. And here we are again today in modern universities where women in the system join forces to blame and shame men into not raping them. John Maxwell, a college student in Denver, put it this way, quote, you definitely get the sense of the problem. One woman told me that she could use statistics to, to determine how many of my friends were rapists, unquote. Hence, one of the first things a male student has to do is submit and sit through sexual respect and consent classes on how not to be a rapist, and he must learn that yes means yes, and that only an enthusiastic yes equates to consent. And even then, let's not forget about regret, seduction, and rape by deceit, that trumps any enthusiastic yes at any time. She always has her women's resource centers, victims advocate offices, or the university sexual assault investigator to go to for help, not to mention any faculty member, campus security, and the police. And more subtly, we have courses on toxic masculinity and male privilege claims that denigrate and berate men and masculinity in order to subjugate men to silence, control, and second-class persons and students, while elevating femaleness and making women superior victims who must be protected. And the fact the university is itself supermajority female in its makeup of students, faculty, and administrators also creates an environment that demands feminine spaces and policies so that all women feel safe even when wearing the minimum or most revealing of clothing or acting out sexually for attention. It's a land of no consequences, <clears throat> agency or responsibilities for women. A highly feminized space and a home away from home where innocent princesses are kept safe by replacement daddy administrators. Indeed, feminism has openly stated at the highest levels that it must break up the family and eliminating the husband and father was a key factor in achieving this goal. Government and society could take his place. <clears throat> to get rid of the husband and father, women pushed to work for sexual liberation and for shameless promiscuity. They would not be controlled, not by man and not by nature. And they needed new laws on rape to help them in their new freedoms. The pill and other forms of birth control, Planned Parenthood, centers and programs and abortion allowed women to create and insist upon new social norms. The double standard should no longer apply. Slut walks were attempts to redefine and eliminate the term and related synonyms. Outrageous behavior and acts were normalized as if to sleep with three men in one day 
or to give head to 10 men in a bar as part of a party game did not make her a slut. She was simply an empowered woman in touch with her sexuality. Never mind nature and the sanctity of the womb, pregnancy or STDs, birth control, abortion and antibiotics says it's okay. New terms to shame men took the place of shaming women. Now we have man sluts and man horse. The tables had turned. It was no longer acceptable to label a woman, but the feminist tactic of shaming men was still very useful. In the same vein, words were used to frame the setting. Women are not sex objects under any circumstance. Whether it be the Hooters girls, boxing ring showgirls between rounds, Miss World, or strippers and lap dancers, and certainly not a wife. It was important to change the law that a man could rape his wife, but not the part that enslaved a man to provide through his income or through outrageous alimony and or child support demands. It's more than okay if men are seen as success objects or ATMs to be preyed upon by gold diggers, traded by hypergamous and snagged by women wanting to marry up the so-called good men or good man. Husbands, fathers, and men must provide. Indeed, it's very interesting that study after study, decade after decade, shows the unemployed or under, underemployed man is the least likely to get married and the most likely to be divorced by the woman. Flipping the same coin, similar research shows that the more money a man has, the more sought after he is and the more likely he is to be married. Hypocritically, feminists and women frame hypergamy and chasing after successful men as totally acceptable and don't see a problem with women choosing to divorce their husbands 80% of the time. Excuse me. <clears throat> Speaking of marriage and family life, it used to be said that women marry for security and men marry for sex. Sadly, feminists have used modern laws to criminalize everyday life in the home and sex and marriage. In truth, feminists and the law have taken away the main benefit an incentive for a man to marry a woman while still giving women what they want and often need. The laws on DV go hand in hand with rape laws. I've touched on this above, but let's be clear on the laws in the West that can punish and destroy any man without proof. The Violence Against Women's Act, VAWA, is allegedly gender neutral, yet 99.9% .9 of shelter space is for women and many refuge centers refuse help of any kind to men because the law assumes man to be the abuser and never the victim. Most police forces apply the law in support of women and against men. Most courts do the same. Sexual assault and rape is one major element of DV and the VAWA. It doesn't matter if you're dating, cohabiting, or married. DV and VAWA can and will be used against you if the woman alleges sexual abuse or rape. <clears throat> it has long been possible in the US, UK, and the West to rape your wife. The old conjugal rights in marriage have long been replaced with, with a woman's right to say no at any time. Yet society still expects the husband to go to work, pay the mortgage, and provide food. Is it any wonder Bettina Arndt of Australia reports about sex-starved husbands and wives who just don't see the need to get in the mood. Feminism, female solidarity, and now modern rape laws allow wives to deny husbands a sex life. It's my firm assertion, this is a major form of domestic abuse and domestic violence that not only causes physical, but emotional and psychological suffering on a scale equal to any form of abuse feminists and women wish to claim and legalize. To me and many other men, sex in the marriage is equally as important as a man providing financially for his family. So let's make a parallel crime and law that covers the offense of, my term, fraud by frigidity, and let it carry the serious sentence that fraud of any other kind does. Bottom line, if you don't love your man, divorce him. If you love him, provide for his needs just as he provides for yours. Can you imagine if a man said he wasn't in the mood to work full time and worked only as he felt? In reality, providing and duty comes in many forms and men need to be and feel acknowledged and loved for what they do and who they are. And sex is the conduit 
of this appreciation and love, and it's the bond that keeps husbands and wives together. Take away sex, lose the bond, and it pretty much guarantees affairs and divorce. And this is never good for families or kids. To be sure, if men weren't trapped and enslaved to marriage and terrible wives by punitive divorce laws and courts, very few men would stay in such unfulfilling marriages. Make no mistake, family law, divorce courts, and rape laws entrap and enslave most men in bad marriages and relationships of abuse, whilst enabling women in their everyday torture of the so-called men they love. <clears throat> Unfortunately, it's very easy to claim rape today. Society, workplaces, universities, and the government and laws overwhelmingly support women in this process, often to the detriment of men and their human rights. Feminism and women's groups push the narrative, believe all women, and automatically use the term victim and perpetrator to frame the setting to man as rapist. Police forces and prosecutors are scrutinized, put under pressure, and judged incessantly in order to intimidate them into more actions, or worse, no action with intent, and more convictions. This has led to scandals where it's come out the forces have lost, not considered, or deliberately refused to hand over social media and mobile phone pictures and data that prove the innocence of numerous men. The case of Liam Allen in the UK highlighted the problem of disclosure by the police, and it seems to be a problem of the times across the UK's and other countries' forces. This is on top of older policies in the justice system that makes it very easy for women to allege rape and not have to face their alleged rapists. Rape shield laws, refusals to admit a woman's sexual history, preferences, and any previous false allegations she's made are all legally in place to spare the woman the ordeal of convincing a jury she was raped and denying the man any chance of a robust defense. Recently, there's a push to video the woman's testimony so she doesn't have to face the defendant. And now the latest demand is for women to make it lawful to be able to withhold any and especially incriminating digital evidence from their social media or cell phones from the defense. They claim it's private. They don't believe it's worth losing a bit of privacy or privacy to get a conviction. This even after knowing the scandal just mentioned above on the police and prosecution deliberately losing or withholding material evidence from the defense or not using this evidence to clear the man. <clears throat> no matter, great damage has already been done to the real victims of rape laws and women's propensity to use them to file false allegations. Remarkably, women are very rarely charged for making false allegations. At most, a few women have been charged for filing false reports or obstruct, obstructing justice. But just how much of a problem is women who file false allegations of rape? One very studied from the 1980s, buried, that eventually came out was a study conducted by the US Air Force. Of 1,218 allegations, 38% were overwhelmingly proved and 17% turned out to be lies, and the woman admitted to lying. The remaining 45% were unresolved. But when facing the threat of a polygraph, 27% more women admitted the lie prior to or after failing the polygraph test. This equates to 29% of women lying and 33% unresolved cases, opening up the possibility that 62% are false. And this study was not a one-off. In 2014, an FBI investigation found that law enforcement only had enough evidence to arrest suspects on 38 to 39 percent of the claims. Again, that's 62 percent that could be false or alleged for other reasons. But why would so many women lie? In the U.S. Air Force report, the reasons given for falsely accusing the men of rape were revenge, 20 percent guilt and shame, 20%. They thought they were pregnant, 13%. To conceal an affair, 12%. To test the husband's love, 9%. Mental or emotional disorders, 9%. To avoid responsibility, 4%. Failure to pay or extortion from the man, 4%. That she thought she 
caught an STD, 3% and other 6%. There's no question rape happens and rapists need to be caught and punished. Every man has a mother and many have sisters and wives. Men also want civility and safety, but rape isn't as prevalent or as one-sided as feminists are saying. What are we to make of made to penetrate or women raping men? What are we to make of the FBI, Department of Justice and CDC research that shows 60 to 80% of rapists, sexual offenders and sexually aggressive men were themselves sexually abused by women in childhood? What are we to make of the number of female guards who rape inmates, boys in detention centers and in places of care? And what are we to make of large, the large numbers of female teachers having sex, raping underage boys at school? And what are we to make of the men who give in to horny girlfriends or wives because he loves his lady? I know I'm guilty of this sexual kindness. It's very telling that so few will study this subject due to the backlash, accusations of misogyny and the likelihood of getting fired if the research conflicts with the feminist narrative that women don't rape. So many won't go there. <clears throat> In summary, women have redefined words and laws and especially laws surrounding rape, sexual assault, harassment and DV to gain power and punish men. Worse still, the state enables and supports them. Paradoxically, feminists have broadened these laws to such a degree that they've criminalized male behavior and male nature, whilst at the same time parading their sexiness and sexuality to levels never before seen. What used to pass as dress for a lady of the night in the 80s is now everyday fashion for young girls. Teach your sons to control their urges and to not rape, they insist, as feminists and women increasingly walk in public with camel toe forming shorts that expose ass cheeks and tops that barely contain their boobs. It must be that PMS and the baby blues excuses all manner of violence by women, even the murder of their own babies. But testosterone should never ever control male behavior. Today, rape is mostly a nuance or a play on the meaning of consent. Consent can easily change to non-consent because a woman interprets the interchange in a different way sometime later. Feelings matter more than circumstance, intent or reality and a woman's choices and actions in the matter count for nothing. Agency, responsible behavior, and wise choices have no place in utopia, where the word should is the ultimate measure. I should be able to drink to excitement, wear the sexiest clothes, tease men into mass hysteria, twerk and grind a man's crotch while dancing, and claim sexual assault when he grabs my tits or hips without consent. I should be able to marry a man have him work two jobs to support any kids and myself and not have to sleep with him. Husbands must perform in all ways, but he should never expect or ask his wife to cater to his sexual needs. No doubt it should, should be a woman's right to sexualize the workplace to her advantage, but desexualize it when she feels vulnerable, less powerful, or just not in the mood. Yes, modern rape laws have made women very powerful. This, isn't just in words or intent, but by way of practice, execution, and expectation. A police force or justice system, system that doesn't convict men of rape must be intimidated and harassed to increase convictions to meet women's insistence that actions match slogans like believe all women and all men are rapists. Slogans and beliefs must become law. prove non-consent and help convict many more rapists because it's not uncommon to believe most people would and should fight back under most circumstances if they were about to be raped. If meanings are not changed back to include reasonable responsibility, this same nonsensical dogma will continue to allow these same instruments of law to ignore evidence and circumstance while expanding the rules of law and rules of evidence that continue to handicap the defense and support the accuser, creating the same kangaroo courts that universities and workplaces created that ignore due process. What more proof do you need to admit we live in a society that hates and punishes men? 
We live in a society that still believes women are morally superior, innocent and pure, despite all the evidence to the contrary. Men are seen as nothing more than a disposable utility for women's benefit. Unfortunately, this belief and custom manifests itself in laws and practices that allows and supports misandry on a national scale never before seen. Make no mistake, modern rape laws increase women's sexual power and further state-sanctioned punitive misandry. Thank you for listening. If you wish to have a, have a copy of my talk, just email me at ken at societykillsmen.com. And lastly, I'd like to draw your attention to my latest adventure, Illustrated Kids Books for Young Boys Age 3 to 10. I introduce you to Brilliant Bob, an adventurous fictional young boy who teaches our real life young boys about positive masculinity through interesting short stories and captivating pictures. Learn with Bob as he discovers the benefits of being brave, competitive, strong, curious, stoic, persistent, and taking a risk. These seven short kids books will soon be out on Amazon individually and later as a box set and will also be found on online at brilliantbobkidbooks.com. Thanks again and goodbye. And just so you get an idea of what they might look like, here are the um, final covers. Well, Brilliant Bob is brave and Brilliant Bob is competitive. And that's just a quick look. So, and also you can find my last book from last year, Society Kills Men, Feminism Loses When Half Are Held Back. That's also on Amazon. This is uh, mainly about suicide, male suicide. Thank you very much and uh, have a good day wherever you are.